before I read the chapter and bring out the quotes and, and go through it in, in detail, I'm just going to quickly run through a summary of what happens in this chapter, The Fourth Night. It starts with a description of the chaotic organisation of Delhi, the traffic and, and the street organisation and so forth. Um, and uh, Balram uses this to make a point about how um, Delhi is disorganised and decisions are, have all been made by kind of self-interested people after money, um, after the British left, and it's not organised um, as a country might if it was trying to better itself, such as um, China, how China has. Uh, he points out the masses of poor people living on the streets in Delhi, people like himself who've come in from the darkness looking for a better life and are getting nowhere. He um, meets a group of servants uh, who... And um, there's a discussion about a publication called Murder Weekly, which is kind of a trashy magazine. And he talks about how servants deep down fantasise about killing their bosses, but that publications like Murder Weekly operate as kind of cheap propaganda um, to keep um, the servants in line, kind of uh, pandering to their desire for a bit of uh, uh, salacious go gossip and um, excitement, but also casting murderers as deviants um, and uh, you know, pushing people towards uh, keeping to the law in that sense. Uh, he meets a character called Vitiligo Lips, who's another um, driver, and he pops up in various places through the chapter. Uh, he's teased generally by the other servants and becomes a... a loner and a, and a recluse but at the same time he looks down on the other drivers he observes them observes them and looks down on them in his work as a driver the brothers ashok and mukesh are um, clearly shown depicted to be bribing people high up in the government they visit the president's mansion and uh, bribe government government ministers um, Bowram describes in a number of places through the chapter um, his empathy for the poor people he sees on the streets. He describes driving around in his air-conditioned car as being in a dark egg, um, looking at another world, which is the world of the streets. But that's, he says at one stage that that world is also his world because that's the world of his father and where he's from. So he's looking from the dark egg um, out into a world that is also his own. As the chapter develops, uh, there's quite a bit of tension between the um, characters of uh, the mongoose Mukesh, um, Ashok and his wife Pinky. Um, Mukesh, otherwise known as the mongoose, is quite suspicious and vigilant in watching Balram and it's, it, it's not... Um, I wouldn't say that he's more suspicious of Balram than any other servant, but he clearly believes that part of a master's role is to um, watch the servants carefully, and if they're not carefully watched, they will start to take liberties and it will escalate out of control. Um, so uh, eventually, partly because of the tension between Pinky and the mongoose, the mongoose leaves, and this leaves Ashok and Pinky uh, with Balram. And Balram makes it clear that that, uh, that Ashok is weak and uh, without the mongoose watching him, he's able to get away with a lot more. Pinky, uh, um, there's a series of events that start to change Balram. Pinky alerts him to his person, uh, poor personal hygiene and the um, Ashok and Pinky draw attention to his ignorant way of speaking, the mispronunciation of words like mall and pizza. Um, Bowram, while parked outside a big shopping mall, sees how the poor are excluded from the shopping mall and why they wear the wrong clothes, and specifically they're in sandals. Um, he also notices Ashok and the T-shirt that he wears and sees that it's something quite different to anything he would ever wear and he deliberately goes and buys a T-shirt like Ashok's. Um, he also buys a pair of shoes and toothpaste, and he dresses up and he sneaks into the mall, um, and it, for him it's quite a frightening moment. It's quite, it's quite a frightening moment for him, 
and a bit of a kind of a foreshadowing of his life as a fugitive. Um, as the chapter develops, Pinky and Ashok are fighting a lot with each other. There's a lot of tension there. Pinky's not happy in Delhi. On her birthday, uh, she drives drunk and kills a child. Brat Balram steps in and, and uh, helps Pinky and Ashok get away. And uh, he cleans up the car and he's proud of the way that he's supported his master and mistress in getting away with this. However, the next morning he finds that Pinky and Ashok have brought in um, the mongoose and he's been he's been brought in as Mr. Fix-It and Balram realises that he is going to be the fall guy. They've bribed a judge um, and that Balram is going to go to prison. Ashok, who he um, admires, uh, has also clearly betrayed him and uh, his own grandmother, Kusum, has put her fingerprint on the paper to uh, okay his um, his supposed confession. So by the end of the chapter, he's thoroughly betrayed by all of these people. The chapter begins with a discussion of the chandelier. Chandelier is often kind of put forward as being an important symbol in uh, the novel. Personally, I don't find it very important or revealing. Um, it's clearly... Uh, it clearly symbolises Balram's, um, you know, affection for his newfound wealth and that it's a, it's a little bit crass because it's a bit overdone. Um, it also, it's a light and he's living in the light and he, it also seems to symbolise, um, oh, there's also, it, I just don't find it a very important symbol. So I'm not going to go into it too much. I'll just read it out. I should talk, and he finished the last chapter talking about his chandelier and how he needed to shed a bit of light on, on a developing dark story. I should talk a little more about this chandelier. Why not? I've got no family anymore. All I've got is chandeliers. And perhaps you could say it's symbolic of, of wealth then. He's got rid of his family. Now he's got wealth. I have a chandelier here above my head in my office, and then I have two in my apartment in Raj Mahal Villas, phase two. One in the drawing room and a small one in the toilet too. It must be the only toilet in Bangalore with a chandelier. I saw all these chandeliers one day tied to a branch of a big banyan tree, banyan tree near Lalbar Gardens. A boy from a village was selling them, and I bought all of them on the spot. I paid some fellow with a bullet cart to bring them home and we were riding through Bangalore, me and this fellow, and four chandeliers on a limousine powered by bulls. It makes me happy to see a chandelier. Why not? I'm a free man. Let me buy all the chandeliers I want. For one thing, they keep the lizards away from this room. It's the truth, sir. Lizards don't like the light. So as soon as they see a chandelier, they stay away. So liz the lizard was kind of symbolic of Balram's fear of everything that was was horrible in the darkness and so I guess by having these bright happy things in every room they sign it kind of chase away um chase away his you know the, the dark memories and the dark thoughts and the fears that he might have I don't understand why other people don't buy chandeliers all the time and put them up everywhere free people don't know the value of freedom that's the problem Sometimes in my apartment, I turn on both chandeliers. Sometimes in my apartment, I turn on both chandeliers and then I lie down amidst all that light and I just start laughing. A man in hiding and yet he's surrounded by chandeliers. There, I'm revealing the secret to a successful escape. The police searched for me in the darkness, but I hid myself in light. And I think that's that whole phrase, hiding in plain, plain sight. Sometimes if you are um, very conspicuous, but no one recognises you because you're so different, you're actually safer than if you uh, keep your identity and your way of doing things, but try to hide in that way. So he's hiding in plain sight by having changed himself. In Bangalore... Now, amongst the many uses of a chandelier, this most unsung and unloved object is that when you forget something, 
all you have to do is stare at the glass pieces shining in the ceiling long enough and within five minutes you'll remember exactly what it is you were trying to remember. See, I'd forgotten where we left off the story last night, so I had to go on about chandeliers for a while, keeping you busy, but now I remember where we were. Delhi. We had got to Delhi last night when I stopped the narrative. The capital of our glorious nation, the seat of Parliament, of the President, of all the Ministers and Prime Ministers, the pride of our civic planning, the showcase of the Republic. That's what they call it. Let a driver tell you the truth. And the truth is that Delhi is a crazy city. And let's remember that this novel is all about Balram telling us at his truths what is true for the poor, what is true for Balram. And in this case, the truth we had the truth about Bangalore, Bangalore before. Now we've got the truth about Delhi. And up here, we've got actually what is true. It is the, the capital. Um, it's the seat of parliament and so forth. Um, but actually, he's, this is dripping with sarcasm here because he's going to show us uh, some uh, negatives. And the truth about Delhi is that it is a crazy city. There's a, a really long discussion here, which is not that important, of lots of details of, of why um, Delhi's sort of a confused and disorganised place. I'll just read them. See, the rich people live in big housing colonies like Defence Colony or Greater Kailash or Vasant Kunj, and inside their colonies the houses have numbers and letters but this numbering and lettering system follows no known system of logic. For instance, in the English alphabet, A is next to B, which everyone knows, even people like me who don't know English. But in a colony, one, these colonies like um, gated communities, I imagine, one house is called A231 and then the next is F378. So one time Pinky Madam wanted to, me to take her to Greater Kailash E231 I tracked down the houses to E200, and just when I thought we were almost there, E block vanished completely. The next house was S something. Pinky Madam began yelling, I told you not to bring this yokel from the village. I've highlighted yokel because it's a really interesting word. Um, informal, often, you probably can't quite see all of that definition there. I don't think I can drag it across. But uh, what it says here is that it's an informal, often derogatory term for an uneducated and unsophisticated person from the countryside. And its origins are in the early 19th century. Um, and I think that it is, well, probably, actually, I don't know where it's, what country it's from. But it's, it's interesting that she's used it because it's an English word, specific English word, um, for, um, you know, an uneducated, ignorant person from the country. Okay, and then another thing, every road in Delhi has a name, like Oran Gazeb Road or Humanyan Road or Archbishop Macarius Road, and no one, masters or servants, knows the name of the road. You ask someone, where's Nikolai Copernicus, Marg? And he could be a man who lived on Nikolai Copernicus, Marg, his whole life. And he'll open his mouth and say, huh? Or he'll say, straight ahead and turn left, even though he has no idea. Now, this is interesting. It reminded me of, of traveling, and I wonder if it is an experience of people traveling um, all over the world, perhaps, that uh, that uh, getting directions from people can be quite uh, quite difficult. And, um, and who knows? And all the roads look the same. All of them go around and around grassy circles in which men are sleeping or eating or playing cards. And then four roads shoot off from that grassy circle. And then you go down one road and you hit another grassy circle where men are sleeping or playing cards. And then four more roads go off from it. So you just keep getting lost and lost and lost in Delhi. It actually reminds me of getting lost and lost and lost in Bangkok, which felt like the same kind of thing. And actually... Once in Fiji as well. I wonder if that might be a common experience when you're lost in a city that everything just looks the same. Thousands of people live on the sides of the roads in Delhi. 
They have come from the darkness too. You can tell by their thin bodies, filthy faces, and by the animal-like way they live under the huge bridges and overpasses, making fires and washing and taking lice out of their hair while the cars roar past them. These homeless people are a particular problem for drivers. They never wait for a red light, simply dashing across the road on impulse. And each time I brake to avoid slamming the car into one of them, the shouting would start from the passenger's seat. But I ask you, who built Delhi in this crazy way? Which geniuses were responsible for making F block come after A block and house number 69 come after house number 12? Who was so busy partying and drinking English liquor and taking their Pomeranian dogs for walks and shampoos that they gave the roads names that no one could remember? So he's having a go here at the way that India has built itself, you know, created itself as a nation after the British left, that instead of, of uh, you know, being organised and efficient and uh, and and creating a country that was good to live in, people have been lining their own pockets and everyone's only really, really interested in making a buck and that this has led to um, a state of chaos. Are you lost again, driver? Don't go after him again. Why do you always defend him, Ashok? Don't we have more serious things to discuss? Why are we always talking about this driver? All right, let's discuss the other things then. First, let's discuss your wife and her temper tantrums. So this is Mukesh and Ashok arguing it in the car. So the first person speaking, Mukesh, are you lost again, driver? Then Ashok says, don't go after him again. Why do you always defend him, Ashok? Um, so they're arguing, the brothers are arguing. Do you really think it's more important than the tax thing? I keep asking you what, what we are doing about it, and you keep changing the topic. I think it's insane how much they're asking us to pay. I told you, it's a political thing. They're harassing us because father is trying to distance himself from the great socialist. I don't know why he ever got involved with that rogue. He got into politics because he had to, Ashok. You don't have a choice in the darkness. And don't panic. We can deal with this income tax charge. This is India, not America. There's always a way out here. I told you, we have someone here who works for us. Raman Ramanathan. He's a good fixer. Ramanathan is a sleazy, oily cretin. We need a new tax lawyer, Mukesh. We need to go to the newspapers and tell them we've been raped by these politicians. Listen, the mongoose raised his voice. You just got back from America. Even this man driving our car knows more about India than you do right now. We need a fixer. He'll get us the interview with the minister that we need. This is how Delhi works. So um, Ashok is being portrayed as someone who is completely ignorant of the ways of India. The mongoose leaned forward and put his hand on my shoulder. Lost again? Do you think you could find your way home this time without getting lost a dozen times? He sighed and fell back in his seat. We shouldn't have brought him here. He's hopeless. Ram Bahadur got it all wrong about this fellow Ashok. Hmm? Look up from your phone for a minute. Have you told Pinky that you're staying back for good? Hmm, yes. What does the Queen say? Don't call her that. She's your sister-in-law, Mukesh. She'll be happy in Guragon. It's the most American part of the city. Now, Mr. Ashok's thinking was smart. Ten years ago, they say there was nothing in Guragon, just water buffaloes and fat Punjabi farmers. Today, it's the modernist suburb of Delhi. American Express, Microsoft... All the big American companies have offices there. The main road is full of shopping malls. Each mall has a cinema inside. So if Pinky Madam missed America, this was the best place to bring her. This moron, the mongoose said, see what he's done? He's got lost again. He stretched his hand and smacked my skull with it. Look, these little things here, this idea that the bosses hit the workers. Um, is uh, worth noting. He 
He stretched his hand and smacked my skull with it. Take a left from the fountain, you idiot. Don't you know how to get to the house from here? I began apologising, but a voice from behind me said, It's all right, Barham. Just get us home. See? You're defending him again. Just put yourself in his place, Mukesh. Can you imagine how confusing Delhi must be to him? It must be like getting to New York for the first time was for me. So this bit here is really interesting. This is Ashok is identifying with Balram here. So put yourself in his place. Can't you imagine what it's like for him? And that's about empathy. And Ashok's able to see his own, relate his own experience in New York to Balram's experience. Um, the mongoose switched to English and I didn't catch what he said, but Mr. Ashok replied in Hindi. Pinky thinks the same too. That's the only thing she and you can agree on. But I won't have it, Mukesh. We don't know who's who in Delhi. This fellow, we can trust him. He's from home. So this is Ashok. His, his naivety is extreme. The idea that, that Balram can be trusted because he comes from home. Uh, at, the mo at, at that moment, I looked at the rearview mirror and I caught Mr. Ashok's eyes looking at me. And in those master's eyes, I saw the most unexpected emotion, pity. How much are they paying you? I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll, no, I'll keep going. How much are they paying you, country mouse? Enough, I'm happy. Not telling me, oh, country mouse. Good boy, a loyal servant to the end. Liking Delhi? Yes. Ha, don't lie to me, sister fucker. I know you're completely lost here. You must hate it. He tried to put his hand on me, and I squirmed and moved back. He had a skin disease, vitiligo, and turned his and it, tur it had turned his lips bright pink in the middle and a pitch black face. I'd better explain about this skin di di disease, which afflicts so many poor people in our country. I don't know why you get it, but once you do, your skin changes colour from brown to pink. Nine cases out of ten. It's a few bright pink spots on a boy's nose or cheeks, like a star exploding on his face, or a rash of pink on the forearm, like someone burned him with boiling water there. But sometimes a fellow's whole body has changed colour, and as you walk past you think, an American. You stop to gape, you want to go near and touch, then you realise it's just one of ours with that horrible condition. In the case of this driver, since the flash of pink had completely discoloured his lips and nothing else, he looked like a clown at a circus with painted lips. My stomach churned just to see his face. Still, he was the only one of the drivers who was being nice to me, so I stayed close to him. Now, this vitiligo, I didn't know very much about that, but it did rang, uh, rang a bell, so when I looked it up, it was the condition that Michael Jackson said that he had that uh, causes the skin pigment to go pale. And actually, after he died, they they did actually say that he, he really did have it. Um, interestingly, although um, Aravinda Diga presents it as a disease of poverty, um, from what I read, it uh, seems to be just one of those random diseases that people have um, that has no cause... Uh, and actually no cure. So I don't know what the truth is, but uh, there you have it. Reading on. Anyway, Balram is very unkind to this poor fellow. He can't help the condition that he has. Anyway, this stuff on the mall is interesting. We were outside the mall. We, a dozen or so chauffeurs, were waiting for our masters to finish their shopping. We weren't allowed inside the mall, of course. No one had to tell us these things. We had made a ring by the side of the car park and we were smoking and chatting. Every now and then someone would emit a red jet of pan from his mouth. Now, I've experienced this myself, travelling in Indonesia, that uh, various places that, that I've been to, it really did seem that you, you needed to be uh, of a wealthy, either a tourist or of a wealthy class to be allowed in. Um, and there were security guards at the, the doors clearly um, turning people away if they didn't look like the right kind of people um, to, to be in the mall. Uh, on account of the fact that he was he too was from the darkness, he had, of course, guessed my origin at once. 
The driver with the diseased lips gave me a course on how to survive Delhi and make sure I wasn't sent back to the darkness on the top of a bus. The main thing to know about Delhi is that the roads are good and the people are bad and the police are totally rotten. I've saved, obviously saved those quotes. Um, if they see you without a seatbelt, you'll have to bribe them 100 rupees. Um, our master... Our masters are not such a great lot either. When they go for their late night parties, it's hell for us. You sleep in the car and the mosquitoes eat you alive. If they're malaria mosquitoes, it's all right. You'll just be raving for a few couple of weeks. But if it's the dengue mosquitoes, then you're in deep shit and you'll die for sure. At two in the morning, he comes back banging on the windows and shouting for you and he's reeking of beer and he farts in the car all the way back. The cold gets really bad in January. If you know he's having a late night party, take along a blanket so you can cover yourself in the car. Keep some mosquitoes away too. Now you'll get bored sitting in the car and waiting for him to come back from his parties. I knew one driver who went nuts from the waiting. So you need something to read. You can read, can't you? Good. This is absolutely, this is absolutely the best thing to read in the car. Now, don't, don't forget to collect these examples for your corruption file if, you, if you're stringing together a list of examples. So, the, you know, the police being bad and having to bribe them and so forth. All right, so um, this thing that you're meant to read, 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 absolutely the best thing to read in the car. He gave me a magazine with a catchy cover. A woman in her underwear was lying on a bed, cowering from the shadow of a man. Murder Weekly, rupees 4.50. Exclusive true story, a good body never goes to waste. Murder, rape, revenge. Now I have to tell you about this magazine, Murder Weekly, since our Prime Minister certainly won't tell you anything about it. It's sold in every newsstand in the city, alongside the cheap novels, and it is very popular reading amongst the servants of the city, whether they be cooks, children's maids or gardeners. Drivers are no different. Every week when this magazine comes out with a cover image of a woman cowering from her would-be murderer, some driver has bought the magazine and is passing it around to the other drivers. Now, don't panic at this information, Mr Premier. No beads of chill sweat need form on your yellow brow. Just because drivers and cooks in Delhi are reading Murder Weekly, it doesn't mean that they are all about to slit their master's necks. Of course, they'd like to. Of course they'd like to. Of course, a billion servants are secretly fantasising about strangling their bosses. You'll see I've saved that bit. And that's why the government of India publishes this magazine and sells it on the streets for just four and a half rupees, so that even the poor can buy it. So the government's publishing this magazine. You see, the murderer in the magazine is so mentally disturbed and sexually deranged, now this word deranged, it's a great little vocab word, uh, insane, of course you to be insane, um, so sexually dis deranged, that not one reader would want to be like him, and in the end he always gets caught by some honest, hard-working police officer, ha, or goes mad and hangs himself by a bedsheet after writing a sentimental letter to his mother or primary school teacher, or is chased, beaten, buggered and garroted by the brother of the woman he's done in. So if your driver is busy flicking through the pages of Murder Weekly, relax, no danger to you. Quite the contrary. So Murder Weekly is a distraction for the poor, and it also kind of allows them to sort of see murder as as being um, uh, the an activity that, that is only done by crazy people and also one that you end up coming out, you know, in a bad way from either in jail or dead or, or whatever. And that's why the government's happy for the poor to read it. It's when your driver starts to read about Gandhi and the Buddha that it's time to wet your pants, Mr. Jabal. So um, Gandhi um, certainly led the revolution against the, the British, the independence movement, to get the British out of um, out of India, uh, and I'm not sure why the Buddha actually, but uh, yeah, so that's when you should worry is when your servants are starting to read things that are a little bit more serious. 
After showing it to me, Vitiligo Lips closed the magazine and threw it into the circle where the other drivers were sitting. They made a grab for it like a bunch of dogs rushing after a bone. He yawned and looked, and looked at me. What does your boss do for a living country mouse? I don't know. Being loyal or being stupid country mouse? Where's he from? Darn bad. He's into coal then. Probably here to bribe ministers. It's a rotten business, coal. He yawned again. I used to drive a man who sold coal. Bad, bad business. But my current boss is into steel, and he makes the coal men look like saints. Where does he live? I told him the name of our apartment block. My master lives there too. We're neighbours. He sidled right up to me without moving away. That would have been rude. I tilted my body as far as I could from his lips. Country Mouse, does your boss, he looked around and dropped his voice to a whisper, need anything? What do you mean? Does your boss like foreign wine? I have a friend who works at a foreign embassy as a driver. He's got contacts there. You know the foreign wine em- uh, you know the foreign wine foreign embassy scam? I shook my head. The scam is this country mouse. Foreign wine is very expensive in Delhi because it's taxed. But the embassies get it in for free. They're supposed to drink their wine, but they sell it on the black market. I can get him other stuff too. Does he want golf balls? I've got people in the US consulate who will sell me that. Does he want women? I can get that too. If he's into boys, no problem. My my master doesn't do these things. He's a good man. And I've saved this because, you know, there's plenty of evidence uh, in this that at this stage, Balram has a pretty high opinion of Ashok. And I think it's because he, he regards him so highly that he's become so angry with him when he lets him down. The diseased lips opened up into a smile. Aren't they all? He began whistling some Hindi film song. One of the drivers had begun re- reading out a story from the magazine. All the others had gone silent. I looked at them all for a while. I turned to the driver with the horrible pink lips and said, I've got a question to ask you. All right, ask. You know I'll do anything for you, country mouse. This building, the one they call a mall, the one with the posters of women hanging on it, it's for shopping, right? Right. And that, I pointed to a shiny glass building to our left, is that also a mall? I don't see any posters of women hanging on it. That's not a mall, country mouse. That's an office building. They make calls from there to America. What kind of calls? I don't know. My master's daughter works in one of those buildings too. I drop her off at eight o'clock and she comes back at two in the morning. I know she makes pots and pots of money in that building because she spends it all day, spends it all day in the malls. He leaned in close. The pink lips were just centimetres from mine. Between the two of us, I think it's rather odd. Girls going into buildings late at night and coming out with so much cash in the morning. He winked at me. What else, country mouse? You're a curious fellow. I pointed to one of the girls coming out of the mall. What about her country mouse? You like her? I blushed. Tell me, I said. Don't the women in cities like her have their hair, have hair in their armpits pits, and on their legs like women in our villages? So he's very naive, Balram. These two stories show that. He doesn't know the difference between, between a shopping mall and an office building. And, uh, and he's you know, really noticing the difference between city women and uh, country women. women. After half an hour, Mukesh Sir and Mr. Ashok and Pinky Madam came out of the mall with shopping bags. I ran ahead to take their bags from them and put them in the back of the car and then closed the back and jumped into the driver's seat of the Honda City and drove them to their new home, which was up on the 13th floor of a gigantic apartment building. The name of the apartment building was Buckingham Towers B Block. So the only reason I've saved that is I know that in essays it's good to get details from the text into your essays and this is a nice little tidy little detail um, you know when you can talk about them living where they live at Buckingham Towers B Block. It was next to another huge apartment building built by the same housing company which was Buckingham Towers A Block. Next to that was Windsor Manor A Block and there were 
um, apartment blocks like this, all shiny and new, and with nice big English names as far as the eye could see. I guess you could also use it for that as well. The idea of this kind of, you know, the English names and the legacy um, of the English having been there, and that when um, when Indian people step into, you know, wealthy positions, it's the English sounding kind of names for accommodation and so forth that they that they're tending to choose it's still associated with with wealth um buckingham towers number b was one of the best it had a nice big lobby and a lift in the lobby that all of us took up to the 13th floor personally i didn't like the apartment much the whole place was the size of the kitchen in Dunbar. there were nice soft white sofas inside and on the wall above the sofas, a giant frame, framed photo of cuddles and puddles. Remember, they're the dogs that Balram has, has had to wash and take care of. The stork had not allowed them to come with us to the city. I couldn't stand to look at those creatures even in a photograph and kept my eyes to the carpet the whole time I was in the room. So I saved that because I thought perhaps there could be a time when you might want to be discussing... Um, his having to look after the dogs and what a lowly, you know, what a lowly occupation it was, how demeaning, degrading it was for him. And, and here's uh, an example of that. He doesn't even want to look at a photograph of the dogs. Um, which had the additional benefit of giving me the look of a pucker. I don't know how you say that, this word pucker. Now, I looked it up and it's, it's, a, it's not a, an English word. It's a um, Hindi word. And I think it means solid, just means solid. So um, giving me the look of a solid servant. So because he's got his eyes down. Leave the bags anywhere you want, Balram. That's Ashok saying that. No, put them down next to the table. Put them down exactly there, the mongoose said. So here there's Ashok with his free and easy attitude with the servants, letting the servants make decisions. The mongoose saying, no, we give the servants direct instructions and they must obey after putting the bags down i went into the kitchen to see if any cleaning needed to be done there was a servant just to take care of the apartment but he was a sloppy fellow and as i said they didn't really have a driver just a servant who drove the car sometimes i knew without being told i also had to take care of the apartment any cleaning there was to be done i would do and then come back and wait near the door with folded hands until Mukesh, sir, said, you can go now and be ready at 8 a.m. No hanky-panky, just because you're in the city, understand? Then I went down in the lift, got out, of, got out of the building and went down the stairs to the servants' quarters in the basement. I don't know how buildings are designed in your country, but in India, every apartment block, every house, every hotel is built with the servants' quarters, sometimes at the back, and sometimes, as in the case of Buckingham Ham Towers B Block, underground. A warren of interconnected rooms where all the drivers, cooks, sweepers, maids and chefs of the apartment block can rest, sleep and wait. When our masters wanted us, an electric bell began to ring throughout the quarters. We would rush to a board and find a red light flashing next to the numbers of the apartment whose servant was needed upstairs. I walked down two flights of stairs and pushed open the door to the servants' quarters. The moment I got there, the other servants screamed. They yelled. They howled with laughter. The vitiligo-lipped driver was sitting with them, howling the hardest. He had told them the question I had asked him. They could not get over their amusement. Each one of them had to come up to me and force his fingers through my hair and call me village idiot and slap me on the back too. Servants need to abuse other servants. It's been bred into us the way Alsatian dogs are bred to attack strangers. So obviously I've saved that quote. That I and I think that's one of the ways that um, that Bowram depicts the the rich being able to rule is by being able to to turn the servants against each other. Um, we attack anyone who's familiar. There and then I resolved never again to tell anyone in Delhi anything I was thinking, especially not another servant. They kept teasing all evening long and even in the night when we went in, into the dormitory to sleep. Something about my face, my nose, my teeth, I don't know, it got on their nerves. They even teased me about my uniform, 
See, in cities, the drivers do not wear uniforms. They said I looked like a monkey in that uniform, so I changed into a dirty shirt and trousers like the rest of them. But the teasing, it just went on all night long. There was a man who swept the dormitory, and in the morning I asked him, Isn't there somewhere a man can be alone here? There's one empty room on the other side of the quarters, but no one wants it, he told me. Who wants to live alone? It was horrible, this room. The floor had not been finished, and there was a cheap whitish plaster on the walls in which you could see the marks of the hand that had applied the plaster. There was a flimsy little bed, barely big enough even for me, and a mosquito net on top of it. It would do. The second night I did not sleep in the dormitory. I went to the room. I swept the floor, tied the mosquito net to four nails on the wall, and went to sleep. In the middle of the night I understood why the mosquito net had been left there. Noises woke me up. The wall was covered with cockroaches, which had come to feed on the minerals or the limestone in the plaster. Their chewing made a continuous noise, and their antenna trembled from every spot on the wall. Some of the cockroaches landed on top of the net. From inside I could see their dark bodies against its white weave. I folded in the fibre of the net and crushed one of them. The other cockroaches took no no notice of this. They kept uh, landing on the net and getting crushed. Maybe everyone who lives in the city gets to be slow and stupid like this, I thought, and smiled and went to sleep. Had a good night among the roaches, they teased when I came to the common toilet. Any thought I had of rejoining the dormitory ended there. The room was full of roaches, but it was mine, and no one teased me. One disadvantage was the electric bell did not penetrate this room, but that was a kind of advantage too, I discovered in time. In the morning, after waiting my turn at the common toilet, and then my turn at the common sink, and then my turn at the common bathroom, I went up one flight of stairs, pushed open the door to the car park, and walked to the spot where the Honda City was parked. The car had to be wiped with a soft wet cloth inside and outside. A stick of incense had to be placed at a small statue of the goddess Lakshmi, goddess of wealth. I might just keep that. They've got, they've got a statue of the goddess Lakshmi, the, the goddess of wealth in the car, which sat above the dashboard. This had the double advantage of getting rid of the mosquitoes that had sneaked in at night and scenting the inside with an aroma of religion. I wiped the seats, nice plush leather seats. I wiped the dials. I lifted the leather mats on the floor and slapped the dust out of them. There were three magnetic stickers with images of the mother goddess Kali on the dashboard. I had put them there, throwing out Rampersad's magnetic stickers. I wiped them all. There was also a small fluffy ogre with a red tongue sticking out of its mouth hung by a chain from the rearview mirror. It was supposed to be a lucky charm, and the stork liked to see it bob up and down as we drove. I punched the ogre in the mouth, then wiped it clean. Next came the business of checking the box of paper tissues in the back of the car. It was elaborately carved and gilded like something that a royal family had owned, although it was actually made of cardboard. I made sure there were fresh tissues in the box. Pinky Madam used dozens of tissues each time we went out. She said the pollution in Delhi was so bad. She had left her crushed and crumpled used tissues near the box and I had to pick them up and throw them out. So he's drawing attention again here to um, you know, having to do disgusting uh, jobs because the rich have no kind of sense of, um, of what they're... they're put it, what they're forcing other people to do basically she could just as easily clean up after her own filth um all of this detail i haven't really highlighted any of it i think he's just giving us a bit of a background for for what the job involves the buzzer sounded through the car park a voice over the loud microphone said driver balram please report to the main entrance of buckingham b block with the car and so it was that i would get into the honda city drive up a ramp and come out to see my first sunlit sunlight of the day. The brothers were dressed in posh suits. They were standing at the door of the building, chatting and chirping. When they got in, the mongoose said, The Congress Party Headquarters, Balram. We went there the other day. I hope you remember it and don't get lost again. I'm not going to let you down today, sir. Now, I'm just, just going to draw attention to the Congress Party here. Um, because... 
and I know some of the people that listen to these videos are actually from India, so I'm sorry to you guys, and I'm going to try and explain your own country to you, but here in Australia we've got no idea. Um, so I've had to look all this stuff up, and the Congress Party, for those of you who don't know, is um, the, probably the main party in, in India. They are the party that is most often in government, and most of their prime ministers have come from this party. So they're very, very big uh, in Indian politics, and that's where um, Mukesh and Ashok are heading to. They're heading to the people who are at the top. Um, rush hour in Delhi. Cars, scooters, motorbikes, auto rickshaws, black taxis, jostling for space on the road. I might just highlight jostling for space because a lot of this is really just descriptive stuff, but that's a nice a nice uh, phrase to you know talk about the overcrowded nature of, of Delhi. The pollution is so bad that the men on the motorbikes and the scooters have a handkerchief wrapped around their faces. Each time you stop at a red light, you see a row of men with black glasses and masks on their faces, as if the whole city were out on a bank heist that morning. There was a good reason for the face masks. They say the air is so bad in Delhi that it takes 10 years off a man's life. Of course, those in the cars don't have to breathe the outside air. It is just nice, cool, clean, air-conditioned air for us. With their tinted windows up, the cars of the rich go like dark eggs down the road of Delhi. And I love that, that, um, that metaphor, the dark egg. Every now and then an egg will crack open, a woman's hand dazzling with gold bangles stretches out of an open window, flings an empty mineral water bottle onto the road and then the window goes up and the egg is resealed. And I, I just love that image of, of the discarding of, of rubbish onto the road and the gold bracelet and um, <clears throat> and the resealing of the egg, the, you know, the barrier between the outside um, world and the of heat and overcrowdedness and bad air and poverty and the inside world of the cut of the leather seats and and the air conditioning and wealth and so forth. I was taking my particular dark egg right into the heart of the city. To my left, I saw the domes of the president's house, the place where all the important business of the country is done. When the air pollution is really bad, the building is completely blotted out from the road, but today it shone beautifully. In 10 minutes I was at the headquarters of the Congress party. So I mentioned them before, They're the top top party in India, and from their party came, came, uh, comes most of the um, Prime Ministers of, of India, and, uh, and I think it was at the time of this book as well. Now this is an easy place to find because there are always two or three giant cardboard cutout billboards with the face of Sonia Gandhi outside. Now I'm going to expose my my recent ignorance uh, on this, but I looked up Sonia Gandhi because I had no idea who she was, um, and my oh my was that was one of the most interesting stories I've read in a long time. Very ignorant that I don't know who she did not know who she was, but I've asked a few other people and they didn't know either. So I think Australians are just basically ignorant of the politics of of uh, of India. Um, anyway, Sonia Gandhi um, was a young Italian girl, I, I think she was about 18 years old, and she went, her family was just a normal family, and she went to England to kind of go study English and go to university, and she was waitressing in a pub or something, and she met a young man there who was from India, and he was studying engineering. Anyway, it turns out that... Um, his grandfather had been the Prime Minister of India and his mother went on to be, or may have been at that time or shortly afterwards, her name was Indira Gandhi and she became the Prime Minister. So he was basically the Prime Minister's son. Anyway, they fell in love and got married and had a couple of kids and they weren't really that involved in politics. But then Indira Gandhi, who was the Prime Minister of India, got assassinated um, gee, there's a lot of assassinated prime ministers in India, but anyway, she got assassinated and her son, who was married to Sonia, um, kind of went into politics um, and became he became the prime minister. So suddenly Sonia was the prime minister's wife. 
Anyway, it went on for a few more years, and then her husband, he, he got uh, uh, assassinated as well. And over a few years, she became more and more involved in politics and got elected to parliament herself. And eventually, they wanted to make her the prime minister. How's that? Go from being some Italian kid, young kid, to prime minister of India. Anyway, she hasn't been prime minister of India, but all but. She's pretty much at the very top of the, uh, the, the system there. Um, and I think the fact that she isn't Indian by birth is what's um, held them back from installing her as the Prime Minister. Uh, she's certainly been the leader of her party, which is that Congress party. Very, very powerful. Anyway, really interesting to me to, to read about her. So I've learned something new out of that, and hopefully you have too. Uh, anyway, giant billboards with her face on them outside this Congress party, which she's been the leader of. I stopped the car, ran out and opened the door for Mr. Ashok and the mongoose. As he got out, Mr. Ashok said, we'll be back in half an hour. This confused me. They never told me in Danbad when they'd be back. Of course, it meant nothing. They could take two hours to come back or three, but it was a kind of courtesy that they apparently now had to give me because we're in Delhi. So he's sitting there, he's outside the Congress party, and he's watching what's going on, waiting for his bosses to come back. And he sees a few things. A group of farmers came to the headquarters and weren't allowed inside and shouted something or other and left. A TV van came to the headquarters and honked. They were let in at once. So here, these two incidents are placed side by side to show that this Congress party is not really listening to the poor people, the farmers, ordinary people, but they are very interested in their image. Um, and so a TV van would be let in uh, straight away. If you want to keep that for your corruption file, you could keep that to talk about what politicians are interested in their images and not necessarily in, in really understanding or addressing the concern, concerns of, of the poor people. I yawned. I punched the little black ogre in its red mouth and it bobbed back and forth. I turned my head around from side to side. Now, this black ogre, and he, every time he punches that, I'm getting this image of somebody who is is making these little acts of rebellion that he can get away with. Um, sort of, sh he's expressing rebellion without actually doing anything that um, could get him in, into any trouble or could actually help him in any way. It's just an expression of of um, unhappiness. Um, I turned my head around from side to side. I looked at the big poster of Sonia Gandhi. She was holding her hand up in the poster as if waving to me. I waved back. I yawned, closed my eyes and slithered down my seat. With one eye open, I looked at the magnetic sticker of the goddess Kali, who was a very fierce black-skinned goddess holding a scimitar and a garland of skulls. I made a note to myself to change that sticker she looked too much like Granny. And I think that idea of the garland of skulls and a scimitar looking like his Granny is a really quite a nice image of how he sees his grandmother as being like utterly evil, really. Two hours later, the brothers returned to the car. We're going to the President's house, Balram, up the hill. You know the place? Yes, sir, I've seen it. Now, I've already seen most of the famous sites of Delhi, the House of Parliament, the Jantar Mantar, the Quitub, but I'd not yet seen been to this place, the most important one of all. I drove towards Racina Hill, and then all the way up the hill, stopping each time a guard put his hand out and checked inside the car, and then stopping right in front of one of the big domed buildings around the President's house. Wait in the car, Balram, we'll be back in 30 minutes. For the first half an hour, I was too frightened to get out of the car. I opened the door, I stepped out, I took a look around. Somewhere inside these domes and towers that were all around me, the big men of this country, the Prime Minister, the President, top ministers and bureaucrats were discussing things and writing them out and stamping papers. Someone was saying, there, 500 million rupees for that dam. And someone was saying, fine, attack Pakistan then. I wanted to run around shouting, Bowram's here too, Bowram is here too. 
I got back into the car to make sure I didn't do anything stupid and get arrested for it. It was getting dark when the two brothers came out of the building. A fat man walked out with them and talked to them for a while outside the car and then shook their hands and waved goodbye to us. Mr. Ashok was dark and sullen when he got in. So he's Ashok, dark and sullen. He's not happy. The mongoose asked me to drive them back home without making any mistakes again, understand? Yes, sir. They sat in silence, which confused me. If I had just gone into the president's house, I'd roll down the windows and shouted out loud to everyone on the road. Look at that. What? That statue. I think this is Ashok here. Mukesh uh, saying what? And Ashok again. I looked out of the window to see a large bronze statue of a group of men. This is a well-known statue, which you'll no doubt see in Delhi. At the head is Mahatma Gandhi with his walking stick and behind him follow the people of India being led from darkness to light. Now this statue is uh, very is very famous and it is just near the president's house and the people that follow Gandhi, I think there's about 10 of them, they are meant to represent diversity in India. So they come from a range of different um, cultural backgrounds and also represent different sort of classes of wealth within the country. And it's the idea that Gandhi's kind of brought everybody together. The mongoose squinted at the statue. What's it about? I've seen it before. So this is the mongoose. So the mong mongoose also is quite ignorant. So he's seen this statue. He's got no idea what it means. We're driving past Gandhi after having just given a bribe to a minister. It's a fucking joke, isn't it? So this is Ashok. And he's sort of saying, oh, gosh, we've just been into the top, top government ministers and paid them off. And here we're walking past the statue of Gandhi saying what a great country India is. You sound like your wife now, the mongoose said. I don't like swearing. It's not part of our traditions here. And I like that too because, um, you know, the mongoose, Mukesh, he's got his own standards. He's not, they've got their own way of doing things. It's okay to bribe a minister, but it's not okay to swear. But Mr. Ashok was too red in the face to keep quiet. It is a fucking joke, our political system, and I'll keep saying it as long as I like. Things are complicated in India, Ashok. It's not like America. Please reserve your judgment. And when they say reserve your judgment, that means wait until you understand. So don't judge India until you actually understand. So he's basically saying, Ashok, you don't really understand what this country is all about. You don't behave in a way... Uh, that, that fits our standards, you know, our standards say it's okay to bribe somebody, but you're not to swear. Um, so it's an interesting exchange between the two brothers. There was a fierce jam on the road to Gurgaon. Every five minutes the traffic would tremble. We'd move a foot, hope would rise, then the red lights would flash on the cars ahead of me and we'd be stuck again. Everyone honked. Every now and again the various horns, each with its own pitch, blended into one continuous wail that sounded like a calf taken from its mother. Fuels fumed the air. Wisps of blue exhaust glowed in front of every headlight. The exhaust grew so fat and thick it could not rise or escape, but spread horizontally, sluggish and glossy, making a kind of fog around us. Matches were con continually being struck. The drivers of auto rickshaws lit cigarettes, adding tobacco pollution to petrol pollution. A man driving a buffalo cart had stopped in front of us. A pile of empty car engine oil cans, 15 feet high, had been tied by rope to his cart. His poor water buffalo, to carry all that load while sucking in this air. The auto rickshaw driver next to me began to cough violently. He turned to the side and spat three times in a row. Some of the spit flecked the side of the Honda City. I glared, raised my fist. He cringed and namaste'd me in apology. It's like we're in a concert of spitting, Mr. Ashok said, looking at the auto rickshaw driver. Well, if you were out there breathing that acid air, you'd be spitting like him too, I thought. So again, this is Bowram showing empathy and understanding for the situation of other people. The cars moved, we gained three feet, then the red lights flashed and everything stopped again. In Beijing, apparently they've got a dozen ring roads. Here we have one. No wonder we keep getting jams. Nothing is planned. 
How will we ever catch up with the Chinese? This is Ashok speaking here. Interesting. He's also interested in, in the ways in which China um, has done a better job than India in creating a livable country. By the way, Mr. Jabao, a dozen ring roads. Wow. Perhaps it's Ashok's comments that made Balram interested in China in the first place. Who's, who's, who knows? Dim streetlights were glowing down onto the pavement on either side of the traffic, and in that orange-hued half-light I could see multitudes of small, thin, grimy people squatting, waiting for a bus to take them somewhere, or with nowhere to go, and about to unfurl a mattress and sleep right there. These poor bastards had come from the darkness to Delhi to find some light, but they were still in the darkness. Hundreds of them, there seemed to be, on either side of the traffic, and their life was entirely unaffected by the jam. Were they even aware that there was a jam? So it's it, the darkness is the rural backward part of India, but the darkness is also, um, there's also a darkness within Delhi, within the city, where these people that have come from this rural, impoverished rural environment are not able to make any kind of headway in the city and they still live um, in poverty, uh, in terrible conditions there as well. And this quote, see how I've highlighted the whole thing here? This is really amazing, amazingly written, really. We, are, we were like two separate cities, inside and outside the dark egg. Remember the dark egg is the car, the uh, air-conditioned, you know, wealthy internal... Um, space that Bowram inhabits with his employers, the tinted windows, so that's why it's dark, um, inside and outside the dark egg. I knew I was in the right city, so the right city being he's glad he's in the car, but my father, if he were alive, would be sitting on that pavement, cooking some rice gruel for dinner and getting ready to lie down and sleep under a street lamp. And I couldn't stop thinking of that and recognising his features in some beggar out there. So I was in some way out of the car too, even while I was driving it. This is Balaam talking about the way that he can empathise with the poor and he can see his father's experience in the face of any old beggar on the street. And it's an, it's an amazing quality he has that he can still feel for the poor in that way. Um, so when people feel like they want to be hard on Balram, he's got some really strong um, empathetic qualities in him as well. Um, but at the same time, he knows, he says, I knew I was in the right city, meaning he's, he's, this is the only place he wants to be in the car. He does not want to be out on the pavement with them. So, but he says, so I was in some way, in some way out of the car too, even while I was driving it. So his heart, I suppose, or his experience, his understanding is outside of the car, even though he's, he's within it. After an hour of thrashing through traffic, we got home at last to Buckingham B block, but the torture wasn't over yet. As he was getting out of the car, the mongoose, and I'm going to talk a bit about his name in a second, what the mongoose means. I'll just do the, I'll read this first, and then I'll talk a little bit about that. The mongoose tapped his pockets, looked confused for a moment and said, I've lost a rupee. Now, first of all, a rupee is about the equivalent of a cent. I looked it up. It, wasn't, it was not much. Two cents, maybe. Very small amount of money. He snapped his fingers at me. Get down on your knees. Look for it on the floor of the car. I got down on my knees. I sniffed in between the mats like a dog, all in search of that one rupee. What do you mean it's not there? Don't you think you can steal from us just because you're in the city? I want that rupee. So he's harassing Balram for that rupee and making a point. You can't steal from us. I'm not going to let you get away with anything. Not one little tiny rupee. And do we think that Mukesh has actually really lost a rupee? Or is he creating this so that he can make a point. This is Ashok speaking here. We've just paid half a million rupees in a bribe, Mukesh, and now we're screwing this man over for a single rupee. Let's go and have a scotch. 
So Ashok, he, he sees that this is not nice, what's being done to Balram, and that the amount of money we're talking about is is totally insignificant. Um, incidentally, this bribe they've just paid is, is only around $8,000. Let's go up and have a scotch. That's how you corrupt servants. It starts with one rupee. Don't bring your American ways here. So Mukesh is concerned with what Balram could get up to if he's not kept in line. He could become corrupted. Where that rupee coin went remains a mystery to me to this day, Mr. Premier. Finally, I took a rupee coin out of my shirt pocket, dropped it on the floor of the car, picked it up and gave it to the mongoose. Here it is, sir. Forgive me for taking so long to find it. There was a childish delight on his dark master's face. So the only reason I can think of that he would be delighted would be that he um, hadn't lost the had not lost the coin in the first place and uh, he's delighted to have so intimidated Balram that Balram has put the coin there himself. He put the rupee coin in his hand and sucked his teeth as if it was the best thing that had happened to him all day. I took the lift up with the brothers to see if any work was to be done in the apartment. Pinky Madam was on the sofa watching TV. As soon as we got in she said, I've eaten already, turned the TV off and went into another room. The mongoose said he didn't want dinner, so Mr. Ashok would have to eat alone at the dinner table. He asked me to heat up some of the vegetables in the fridge for him, and I went into the kitchen to do so. Casting a quick look back as I opened the fridge door, I saw that he was on the verge of tears. So whatever's going on, the bribery, the way Bowram's being treated, um, you know, Pinky Madam's coldness, leaving the room... You know, she obviously doesn't want to spend time with the mongoose. All of that is, is really playing on on, um, on Ashok. When you're the driver, you never see the whole picture. Just flashes, glimpses, bits of conversation. And then just when the masters are coming to the crucial part of their talk, it always happens. Some moron in a white jeep almost hits you while you're trying to overtake a car on the wrong side of the road. You swerve to the side, glare at the moron, curse him silently, and by the time you're eavesdropping again, the conversation in the back seat has moved on, and you never know what, how that sentence ended. I knew something was wrong, but I hadn't realised how bad the situation had become until the morning Mr. Ashok said to me, Today you'll drop Mukesh, sir, at the railway station, Bowroom. Yes, sir, I hesitated. I wanted to ask, just him? Did that mean he was going back for good? Did that mean Pinky Madam had finally got rid of him with her door slamming and tart remarks? At six o'clock I waited with the car outside the entranceway. I drove the brothers to the railway station. Pinky Madam did not come along. I carried the mongoose's bags to the right carriage of the train, then went to a stall and bought him a dosa, wrapped in paper for him. That was what he always liked to eat on the train. Dosas are delicious, by the way. You haven't had one. Oh, they're like a giant pancake and they're often stuffed with like, well, I particularly like them with the, the masala dosa with the mashed potato and herbs and stuff and um, stuffed into it. Delicious. Anyway, uh, so he liked to eat doses on the train, but I unwrapped the dosa. What, 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 what? Go back, go back, go back. I unwrapped the dosa and removed the potatoes, flinging them onto the rail tracks because potatoes made him fart and he didn't like that. A servant gets to know his master's intestinal tract from end to end, from lips to anus. So again, there's that idea that if it, being, it being too familiar, too disgusting, too humiliating, um, this relationship. The mongoose told me, wait, I have instructions for you. I squatted in a corner of the railway carriage. Bowram, you're not in the darkness any longer. Yes, sir. There is a law in Delhi. Yes, sir. You know those bronze statues of Gandhi and Nehru that are everywhere? The police have put cameras inside their eyes to watch for cars. They see everything you do, understand that? Yes, sir. Then he frowned as if wondering what else to say. He said, the air conditioner should be turned off when you are on your own. Yes, sir. Music should not be played when you are on your own. Yes, sir. At the end of each day, you must give us a reading of the meter to make sure you haven't been driving the car on your own. Yes, sir. 
the mongoose, mongoose turned to Mr. Ashok and touched him on the forearm. Take some interest in this, Ashok, brother. You'll have to check up on the driver when I'm gone. But Mr. Ashok was playing with his mobile phone. He put it down and said, The driver's honest. He's from Lex Mangar. I saw his family when we went there. Then he went back to his mobile. Don't talk like that. Don't make a joke out of what I'm saying, the mongoose said. But he was paying no attention to his brother. He kept punching the buttons on his phone. One minute, one minute, I'm talking to a friend in New York. Drivers like to say that some men are first gear types. Mr. Ashok was a classic first gear man. He liked to start things, but nothing held his attention for long. Looking at him, I made two discoveries almost simultaneously. Each filled me with a sense of wonder. Firstly, you could talk on a mobile phone to someone in New York just by punching on its buttons. The wonders of modern science never cease to amaze me. Amaze me. Secondly, I realised that this tall, broad-shouldered, handsome, foreign-educated man who would be my only master in a few minutes when the long whistle blew and this train headed off towards Darnbad was weak, helpless, absent-minded and completely unprotected by the usual instincts that run in the blood of a landlord. If you were back in Laxmanga, we would have called you the lamb. Now, really interesting. Lamb, you know, people eat lambs, right? So the idea is, you know, lambs to the slaughter. But Mr. Ashok is easy meat for anyone who's a little bit tough because he's weak, he's helpless, he's unprotected, he just is not tough enough. And actually, Ashok has realized this because these things that the, that the mongoose is saying to him are what land what the what the wealthy need to do with their servants they need to show them who's boss um, or the servants will begin to take advantage of them um, the mongoose realizes that ashok does not and Baron wakes up to it right here i said before i'd talk a bit about mongoose now it's an animal a mongoose now the indian mongoose is famous for um it's a furry little carnivorous Looks a bit like a, a cross between a cat and a squirrel, um, but it's definitely a carnivore, and it's it's fast and it's clever and it's very very brave. And the Indian mongoose is famous for being able to um, kill snakes, and particularly the cobra snake, which is incredibly dangerous. And it's also famous uh, for being in the Jungle Book, a, Rud a Rudyard Kipling uh, story about a mongoose that that protects a family from snakes. And I think, obviously, a, um, Bowerman and Adiga have called him the mongoose for that reason. He's he's um, crafty and he's trying to protect his family from a snake. Uh, and he suspects, you know, Bowerman could be a snake if he um, was allowed to get away with too much. So that's where the name comes from. Back to the story. Why are you grinning like a donkey? The mongoose snapped at me and I almost fell over, apologising to him. That evening at eight o'clock, Mr. Ashok sent a message to me through another servant. Be ready in half an hour, Balram. Pinky Madam and I will be going out. And the two of them did come down about two and three quarter hours later. The moment the mongoose left, I swear the skirts became even shorter. So once he's gone, Ashok and Pinky can let their guard down a little bit. When she sat in the back, I could see half her boobs hanging out of her clothes each time I had to look in the rear vision mirror. This put me in a very bad situation, sir. For one thing, my beak was aroused, which is natural in a healthy young man like me. On the other hand, as you must know, master and mistress are like father and mother to you. So how can you get excited by the mistress? So this, this idea of father and mother and family, uh, and this being some kind of family relationship, comes up a whole lot, um, particularly in this chapter. I simply avoided looking at the rear view mirror. If there was a crash, it wouldn't be my fault. Mr. Premier, maybe when you've been driving in the thick traffic, you have stopped your car and lowered your window, and then you have felt the hot, panting breath of the exhaust pipe of a truck next to you. Now be aware, Mr. Premier, that there is a hot panting diesel engine just in front of your own nose. Me. 
This is an attempt to be funny. I don't find it particularly funny. Each time she came in with that low black dress, my beak got big. I hated her for wearing that dress, but I hated my beak even more for what it was doing. So even at this, this stage of the novel, Balram is he's trying to be good and to follow the rules. At the end of the month, I went up to the apartment. He was sitting there alone on the couch beneath the framed photo of the two Pomeranians. Sir? Hmm, what's up, Balram? It's been a month. So? Sir, my wages. Ah, yes, 3,000, right? He whipped out his wallet. It was fat with notes and flicked out three notes onto the table. I picked them up and bowed. Something of what his brother had been saying must have got to him because he said, you're sending, me, you're sending some of it home, aren't you? All of it, sir. Just what I need to eat and drink here. The rest goes home. Good, Baron. Good. Family is a good thing. Now, 3,000 rupees is about $50. So he's getting around $50 a month. Now, do we think he's really sending his money home to his family? No. At 10 o'clock that night, I walked down to the market walked down to the market just around the corner from Buckingham Towers number uh, B block it was the last shop in the market on a billboard sign above it a huge black letters in Hindi said action English liquor shop Indian made foreign liquor sold here gotta love that Indian made foreign liquor it was the usual civil war that you find in the liquor shop in the evenings men pushing and straining at the counter with their hands outstretched and yelling at the top of their voices. The boys behind the counter couldn't hear a word of what was being said in that din and kept getting orders mixed up, and that led to more yelling and fighting. I pushed through the crowd, got to the counter, banged my fist and yelled, Whiskey! The cheapest kind! Immediate service or someone will get hurt, I swear! It took me 15 minutes to get a bottle. I stuffed it down my trousers, for there was nowhere else to hide it, and went back to Buckingham. So he's obviously got completely plastered on this cheap whiskey. All right, next day. Bowram, you took your time. Forgive me, madam. You look ill, Bowram. Are you all right? Yes, madam, I have a headache. I didn't sleep well last night. Now make me some tea. I hope you can cook better than you can drive. Yes, madam. I hear you're a halwa. Your family are cooks. Do you know some special traditional type of ginger tea? Yes, madam. Then make it. I had no idea what Miss Pinky Madam wanted, but at least her boobs were covered. That was a relief. I got the tea kettle ready and began making tea. I had just got the water boiling when the kitchen filled up with perfume. She was watching from the threshold. My head was still spinning from last night's whiskey. I had been chewing aniseed all morning so no one would notice the stench of booze on my breath, but I was still worried so I turned away from her as I washed a chunk of ginger under the tap. What are you doing, she shouted. Washing ginger, madam. That's with your right hand. What's your left hand doing? Madam, I looked down. Stop scratching your groin with your left hand. Don't be angry, madam. I'll stop. But it was no use. She would not stop shouting. You're so filthy. Look at you. Look at your teeth. Look at your clothes. There's red pan all over your teeth. And there are red spots on your shirt. It's disgusting. Get out Clean up the mess you've made in the kitchen and get out. I put the piece of ginger back in the fridge, turned off the boiling water and went downstairs. I got in front of the common mirror and opened my mouth. The teeth were red, blackened, rotting from pan. I washed my mouth out, but the lips were still red. She was right. The pan, which I'd chewed for years, like my father and like Kishan and everyone else I knew, was discolouring my teeth and corroding my gums. The next evening, Mr. Ashok and Pinky Madam came down to the entranceway fighting, got in the car fighting and kept fighting as I drove the Honda City from Buckingham to Ham Towers B block onto the main road. So this this sequence is, is kind of beginning where Balram begins to observe more, observe more carefully the rich and what they look like and how they dress and how they groom themselves, how they behave. And he starts to realise that he doesn't look like them and what he needs to do to look more like them. 
um, and to uh, and he begins to copy them. Going to the mall, sir, I asked, the moment they were quiet. Pinky Madam let out a short, high laugh. I expected such things from her, but not from him, yet he joined in too. It's not mal, it's mall, he said. Say it again. I kept saying mal, and they kept asking me to repeat it, and then giggled hysterically each time I did so. By the end, they were holding hands again, so some good came out of my humiliation. I was glad for that, at least. They got out of the car, slammed the door, and went into the mall. A guard saluted as they came close, then the glass doors opened by themselves and swallowed the two of them in. I did not get out of the car. It helped me concentrate my mind better if I was here. I closed my eyes. Mool. No, that wasn't it. Maul. Mala. Country mouse, get out of the car and come here. A little group of drivers crouched in a circle outside the car park in the mall. One of them began shouting at me, waving a copy of a magazine in his hand. It was the driver with the diseased lips. I put a big smile on my face and went up to him. Any more questions about city life, country mouse? he asked. Cannonades of laughter all around him. He put a hand on me and whispered, Have you thought about what I said, sweetie pie? Does your master need anything? Ganja? Girls, boys, golf balls, good quality American golf balls, duty free. Don't offer him all these things now, another driver said. This one was crouching on his knees, swinging a keychain with the keys to his master's car like a boy with a toy. He's raw from the village, still pure. I just highlighted that because it's a, a cute little um, description of Balaam. Let city life corrupt him first. He snatched the magazine, Murder Weekly, of course, and began reading out loud. The gossip stopped. All the drivers drew closer. It was a rainy night. Vishal lay in bed, his breath smelling of liquor, his eyes glancing out the window. The woman next door had come home and was about to remove her. The man with the vitiligo lips shouted, Look there! It's happening today too! The driver with the magazine, annoyed at this disturbance, kept reading, but the others were standing up now looking in the direction of the mall. What was happening, Mr Premier, was one of those incidents that were so common in the early days of the shopping mall and which were often reported in the daily newspapers under the title Is There No Space for the Poor in the Malls of New India? So in, in, interestingly, when the malls first opened, it, this used to happen more often, but people have got used to it, um, the fact that the poor aren't allowed in. They know their place. The glass doors had opened, but the man who wanted to go into them could not do so. So this is a real parallel to the voter that wanted to vote. So this is a real parallel to the voter who wanted to vote, um, this guy. The glass doors had opened, but the man who wanted to go in could not do so. The guard at the door had stopped him. He pointed his stick at the man's feet and shook his head. The man had sandals on his feet. All of us drivers, too, had sandals on our feet, but everyone who was allowed in the mall had shoes on their feet. Instead of backing off and going away as nine in ten in his place would have done, the man in the sandals exploded. Am I not a human being, too? He yelled it so hard that the spit burst from his mouth like a fountain and his knees were trembling. One of the drivers let out a whistle. A man who had been sweeping the outer compound of the mall of them all, put down his broom and watched. For a moment, the man at the door looked ready to hit the guard, but then he turned around and walked away. That fellow has balls, one of the drivers said. If all of us were like that, we'd rule India and they would be polishing our boots. So I've highlighted that quote because it's about, you know, the poor. The only reason that the poor are able to be kept how they are is because they don't rebel. That they are the vast majority, um, but they don't actually stand up for themselves. Then the drivers got back in their circle. The reading of the story resumed. I watched the keys circling in the keychain. I watched the smoke rising from the cigarettes. I watched the pan hit the dirt in red diagonals. The worst part of being a driver is that you have hours to yourself while waiting for your employer. You can spend this time chit-chatting and scratching your groin. You can read murder and rape magazines. You can develop the chauffeur's habit. 
it's kind of yoga really of putting the worst part of being a driver is that you have hours to yourself while waiting for your employer you can spend this time chit-chatting and scratching your groin you can read rape and murder magazines you can develop the chauffeur's habit it's a kind of yoga really of putting a finger in your nose and letting your mind go blank for hours they should call it the bored driver's asana you can sneak a bottle of indian liquor into the car boredom makes drunks of so many honest drivers but if the driver sees his free time as an opportunity if he uses it to think then the worst part of his job becomes the best that evening while driving back to the apartment i looked into the rearview mirror mr ashok was wearing a t-shirt it was like no t-shirt i would ever choose to buy at a store the larger part of it was empty and white and there was a small design in the center i would have bought something very colorful with lots of words and designs on it better value for the money then one night after mr ashok and pinky madam had gone up i went out to the local market under the glare of a naked yellow light bulbs, men squatted on the road, selling basketfuls of glassy bangles, steel bracelets, toys, headscarves, pens, and keychains. I found the fellow selling t-shirts. No, I kept saying to each shirt he showed me, until I found one that was all white, with a small word in English in the centre. Then I went looking for the man selling black shoes. I bought my first toothpaste that night. I got it from the man who usually sold me pan. He had a side business in toothpastes that cancelled out the effects of pan. Shikati whitener with charcoal and cloves to clean your teeth. Only one rupee fifty pays. Okay, so what Balaam's doing here is he's saying instead of instead of sticking with what all the other drivers are doing, wasting their time chatting, drinking, chewing pan, he's going to use his time productively. He's observing what the rich do and he's going to try to copy them as i brushed my teeth with my finger i noticed what my left hand was doing it had crawled up to my groin without my noticing the way a lizard goes stealthily up a wall and was about to scratch i waited the moment it moved i seized it with the right hand so he's saying that this this habit that he has is is something he's he's unaware of but uh and, and uh, interestingly he likens it to the lizard which is that sort of symbol of uh, everything that's bad in the in the darkness i pinched the thick skin between the thumb and the index finger where it hurts the most and held it like that for a whole minute when i let it go a red welt had formed on the skin of the palm there that's your punishment for groin scratching from now on in my mouth the toothpaste had thickened into a milky foam it began dripping down the sides of my lips. I spat it out. Brush, brush, spit. Brush, brush, spit. Why had my father never told me not to scratch my groin? Why had my father never told me to brush my teeth in milky foam? Why had he raised me to live like an animal? Why do all the poor live amid, amid, amid such filth, such ugliness? Brush, brush, spit. Brush, brush, spit. If only a man could spit his past out so easily. Next morning, as I drove Pinky Madam to the mall, I felt a small parcel of cotton pressing against my shoe-clad feet. She left, slamming the door. I waited for ten minutes, and then inside the car I changed. I went to the gateway of the mall. So this parcel at his feet, this is the new T-shirt that he's going to be wearing. I went to the gateway of the mall in my new white T-shirt, but there, the moment I saw the guard, I turned around, went back to the Honda City. I got into the car and punched the ogre three times. I touched the stickers of the goddess Kali with her long red tongue for good luck. This time I went to the rear entrance. I was sure the guard in front of the door would challenge me and say, No, you're not allowed in, even with a pair of black shoes and a t-shirt that is mostly white with just one English word on it. I was sure until the last moment that I would be caught and called back and slapped and humiliated there. Even as I was walking inside the mall, I was sure someone would say, Hey, that man is a paid driver. What is he doing in here? There were guards in grey uniforms on every floor. All of them seemed to be watching me. It was my first taste of the fugitive's life. So these actions that he's taking, this rule-breaking, it's his education laying the groundwork for the much bigger transgression um, that he later takes when he kills Ashok. I was conscious of a perfume in the air, 
a golden light of cool air-conditioned air of people in t-shirts and jeans who were eyeing me strangely. I saw a lift going up and down that seemed to be made of pure golden glass. I saw shops with walls of glass and huge photos of handsome European men and women hanging on each wall. If only the other drivers could see me now. Getting out was as tricky as getting in, but again the guards didn't say a word to me, and I walked back to the car park, got in the car, and changed back into my usual richly coloured shirt and left the man's, the rich man's plain t-shirt in a bundle near my feet. I came running out to where the other drivers were sitting. None of them had noticed me going in or coming out. They were too occupied with something else. One of the drivers, it was the fellow who liked to twirl his keychain all the time, had a mobile phone with him. He forced me to take a look at his phone. Do you call your wife with this thing? You can't talk to anyone with it, you fool. It's a one-way phone. So what's the point of a phone you can't talk to your family with? It's so my master can call me and give me instructions on where to pick him up. I just have to keep it here in my pocket wherever I go. He took the phone back from me, rubbed it clean and put it in his pocket. Until this evening, his status in the driver's circle had been low. His master drove only a Maruti Suzuki Zen, a small car. Today he was being as bossy as he wanted. The drivers were passing his mobile from hand to hand and gazing at it like monkeys gaze at something shiny they had picked up. There was the smell of ammonia in the air. One of the drivers was pissing not far from us. Vitiligo Lips was watching me from a corner. Country Mouse, he said, you look like a fellow who wants to say something. I shook my head. The traffic grew worse by day. There seemed to be more cars every evening. As the jams grew worse, so did Pinky Madam's temper. One evening, when we were just crawling down MG Road into Gurugayon, she lost it completely. She began screaming, Why can't we go back, Ashiki? Look at this fucking traffic jam. It's like this every other day now. Please don't begin that again, please. Why not? You promised me, Ashiki, we'd be in Delhi just three months and get some paperwork done and go back. But I'm starting to think you only came here to deal with this income tax problem. Were you lying to me the whole time? It wasn't his fault what happened between them. I will insist on that, even in a court of law. He was a good husband, always coming up with plans to make her happy. On her birthday, for instance, he had me dress up in a, as a Maharaja with a red turban and dark cooling glasses and serve them their food in this costume. I'm not talking of any ordinary home cook, cooking either. He got me to serve her some of that stinking stuff that comes in cardboard boxes and drives all the rich absolutely crazy. She laughed and laughed and laughed when she saw me in my costume, bowing low to her with the cardboard box. I served them, and then as Mr. Ashok had instructed, stood near the portrait of cuddles and puddles with folded hands and waited. Ashok, Ashok she said, now hear this. Baron, what is it we're eating? I knew it was a trap, but what could I do? I answered. The two of them burst into giggles. Say it again, Baron. They laughed again. It's not pizza. It's pizza. Say it properly. Wait. No, she says, it's pizza. Say it properly. Wait, you're mispronouncing it too. There's a T in the middle. Pizza. Don't correct my English, Ashok. There's no T in pizza. Look at the box. I had to hold my breath as I stood there waiting for him to finish. The stuff smelled so awful. He's cutting the pizza so badly, I just don't understand how he can come from a cast of cooks. You've just dismissed the cook. Please don't fire this fellow. He's an honest one. When they were done. So bowram has got to sit and listen to them discussing whether they're going to fire him all the time or not. When they were done, I scraped the food off the plates and washed them. From the kitchen window, I could see the main road of Gurugayon, full of lights of the shopping malls. A new mall had just opened up at the end of the road and the cars were streaming into its gates. I pulled the window blind down and went back to washing dishes. Pija, Bzija, Zibija, Bzija. So again, he's practicing how to talk like the rich. I wiped the sink with my palm and turned off the lights. The two of them had gone into their bedroom. I heard shouting from the inside. On tiptoe, I went to the closed door. I put my ear to the wood. Shouting rose from both sides, followed by a scream, followed by the sound of man's flesh slapping woman's flesh. 
About time you took charge, O lamb that was born from the loins of a landlord. I locked the door behind me and took the lift down. So in this scene, we've got Ashok hitting Pinky Madam. And interestingly, because this, of course, is, is domestic violence, we've got Balram's opinion of this is that, that he's, he's pleased that Ashok is, is dominating his wife and being strong. It shows different sort of value set. And also this idea of, of, of his showing his dominant over Pinky is uh, sort of counteracting that idea that he's a bit of a lamb and uh, is being weak because, of course, Bowram likes Ashok um, and so wants to see him being strong within his relationship with his wife. So it also shows that, you know, a highly different value system where, you know, domestic violence can be condoned. Half an hour later, just when I was about to fall asleep, another of the servants came and yelled for me. The bell was ringing. I put on my trousers, washed my hands again and again at the common tap and drove the car up to the entrance of the building. Drive us into the city. Yes, sir. We're in the city. Any place you want to go, Pinky? No word from her. Take us to Connaught Place, Balram. Neither husband nor wife talked as I drove. I still had the Maharaja outfit on. Mr. Ashok looked at Pinky Madam nervously half a dozen times. You're right, Pinky, he said in a husky voice. I didn't mean to challenge you on what you said, but I told you there's only one thing wrong with this place. We have this fucked up system called parliamentary democracy. Otherwise, we'd be just like China. Ashok, I have a headache, please. We'll have some fun tonight. There's a good TGI Fridays here. TGI Fridays here. You'll like it. When we got to Connaught Place... He made me stop in front of a big red neon light. Wait for us here, Barham. We'll be back in 20 minutes. They had been gone for an hour, and I was still inside the car, waiting for the lights of Connaught Place. I punched the fluffy black ogre a dozen times. I looked at the magnetic stickers of the goddess Kali with her skulls and her long red tongue. I stuck my tongue out at the old witch. I yawned. It was well past midnight and very cold. I would have loved to play some music to pass the time, but of course the mongoose had forbidden, forbidden that. I opened the door of the car. There was an acrid smell in the car, in the air. The other drivers had made a fire for themselves, which they kept going by shoving bits of plastic into it. The rich of Delhi, to survive the winter, kept electric heaters or gas heaters, or even burned logs of wood in their fireplaces. When the homeless or servants, like night watchmen and drivers, who are forced to spend time outside in winter, want to keep warm, they burn whatever they can find on the ground. One of the best things to put in the fire is cellophane, the kind used to wrap fruits, vegetables and business books in. Inside the flame it changes its nature and melts into a clear fuel. The only problem is that while burning, it gives off a white smoke that makes your stomach churn. Vitiligo Lips was feeding bags of cellophane into the fire with his free hand he waved to me. Country mouse, don't sit there by yourself. That leads to bad thoughts. The warmth was so tempting. But no, my mouth would tickle if I went near them and I would ask for pan. Look at the snob. He's even dressed like a Maharaja today. Come join us, Maharaja of Buckingham. Away from the warmth, away from temptation, I walked down the pathway of Connell Place until the smell of churned mud filled the air. There is construction work in any direction you look in Delhi. Glass skeletons being raised from malls or office blocks. Rows, rows of gigantic T-shaped concrete supports like a line of anvils where the new bridges or overpasses are coming up. Huge craters being dug for new mansions for the rich. And here too in the heart of Connaught Place, even in the middle of the night, under the glare of immense spotlights, construction went on. A giant pit had been excavated. Machines were rumbling from inside it. I, heard, I had heard of this work. They were putting a railway under the ground of Delhi. The pit they had made for this work was as large as any of the coal mines I had seen in Darnbud. Another man was watching the pit with me, a well-dressed man in a shirt and tie and trousers with nice pleats. Normally his kind would never talk to me, but maybe my Maharaja tunic confused him. This city is going to be like Dubai in five years, isn't it? Five, I said contemptuously, in two years. Look at that yellow crane, it's a monster. It was a monster, sitting at the top of the pit, 
with huge metal claws alternately gorging and disgorging immense quantities of mud. Like creatures they had to obey it, men with troughs of mud on their head walked in circles around the machine. They did not look much bigger than mice. Even in the winter night, the sweat had made their shirts stick to their glistening black bodies. It was freezing cold when I returned to the car. All the other drivers had left. Still no sign of my masters. I closed my eyes and tried to remember what I had for dinner. A nice hot curry with juicy chunks of dark meat. Big puddles of red oil in the gravy. Nice. They woke me up by banging on my window. I scrambled out and opened the doors for them. Both were loud and happy and reeked of some English liquor, whatever it was. I hadn't yet tried at the shop. I tell you, they were going at it like animals as I drove them out of Connor Place. He was pushing his hand up and down her thigh, and she was giggling. I watched one second too long. He caught me in the mirror. I felt like a child that had been watching his parents through a slit in their bedroom door. My heart began to sweat. I half expected him to catch me by the collar and fling me to the ground and stamp me with his boots the way his father used to do to fishermen in Laxbanger. But this man, as I've told you, was different. He was capable of becoming something better than his father. So more evidence of, of Balram and his high regard for Ashok. My eyes had touched his conscience. He nudged Pinky Madam and said, We're not alone, you know. So again, he's got this, this conscience, Ashok. She became grumpy at once and turned her face to the side. Five minutes passed in silence, reeking of English liquor. She leaned towards me. Give me the steering wheel. No, Pinky, don't. You're drunk. Let him. What a fucking joke. Everyone in India drinks and drives, but you won't let me do it. Oh, I hate this. He slumped in his seat. Bowram, remember never to marry. Is he stopping at the traffic signal? Bowram, why are you stopping? Just drive. It's a traffic signal, Pinky. Let him stop. Bowram, obey the traffic rules. I command you. I command you to drive, Bowram. Drive. Completely confused by this time, I compromised. I took the car five feet in front of the white line and then came to a stop. Did you see what he did, Mr. Ashok said? That was pretty clever. Yes, Ashok, he's a fucking genius. The timer next to the red light said that there was still 30 seconds to go before the light changed to green. I was watching the timer when the giant Buddha materialised on my right. A beggar child had come up to the Honda City holding up a beautiful plaster of Paris statue of the Buddha. Every night in Delhi, beggars were always selling something by the roadside, books or statues or strawberries in boxes, but for some reason, perhaps because my nerves were in such a bad state, I gazed at this Buddha longer than I should have. It was just a tilt of my head, just a thing that happened for half a second, but she caught me out. Bowram appreciates the statue, she said. Mr. Ashok chuckled. Sure, he's a connoisseur of fine art. She cracked the egg open. She lowered the window and said, Let's see it to the beggar child. He or she, you can never tell with beggar children, Push the Buddha into the Honda. Do you want to buy the sculpture driver? No, madam, I'm sorry. Bowram Howai, maker of sweets, driver of cars, connoisseur of sculpture. I'm sorry, madam. The more I apologised, the more amused the two of them got. At last, putting an end to my agony, the light changed to green and I drove away from the wretched Buddha as fast as I could. She reached over and squeezed my shoulder. Bowram, stop the car. I looked at Mr. Ashok's reflection. He said nothing. I stopped the car. Bowram, get out. We're leaving you to spend the night with your Buddha. The Maharaja and the Buddha together for the night. So how cruel is that? Get kicking him out of the car and driving off on him. She got into the driver's seat, started the car and drove away while Mr. Ashok, dead drunk, giggled and waved goodbye at me. If he hadn't been drunk, he never would have allowed her to treat me like this. I'm sure of that. So there's Ashok making excuses for Ashok's. Uh, there's Bowram making excuses for Ashok's um, treatment of him. People were always taking advantage of him. If it were just me and him in the car, nothing bad would ever have happened to either of us. There was a traffic island separating the two sides of the road and trees had been planted in the island. I sat down under a tree. The road was dead. When two cars went by, one behind the other, their headlights may hear continuous ripple on the leaves like you see on the branches of trees that glow by a lake. 
How many thousands of such beautiful things there must be to see in Delhi if you were just free to go wherever you wanted and do whatever you wanted. A car was coming straight towards me, flashing its headlights on and off and sounding its horns. The Honda City had done a U-turn, an illegal U-turn, mind you, down the road and was charging right at me as if to plough me down. Behind the wheel I saw Pinky Madam grinning and howling while Mr Ashop next to her was smiling. Did I see a wrinkle of worry for my fate on his forehead? Did I see his hand reach across and steady the steering wheel so that the car wouldn't hit me? I like to think so. The car stopped half a foot in front of me with, this, with a screech of burning rubber. I cringed how my poor tyres had suffered because of this woman. Pinky Madam opened the door and popped her grinning face out. Thought I really had left you be behind, Mr Maharaja. No, Madam. You're not angry, are you? Not at all. And then I added to make it more believable. Employers are like mother and father. How can one be angry with them? I got into the back seat. They did an, another U-turn across the middle of the avenue and then drove off at top speed, racing through one red light after the other. The two of them were shrieking and pinching each other and making giggling noises and helpless to do anything. I was just watching the show from the back seat when the small black thing jumped into our path and we hit it and knocked it over and rolled the wheels of the car over it. So I've highlighted small black thing here because it kind of is a, a you know, it's a good sort of quote to illustrate how the poor in, uh, in India become, you know, almost like they're dehumanised and become, you know, th their lives aren't worth a lot. From the way the wheels crunched it completely and from how, and again there's that it here, and from how there was no noise when she stopped the car, not even a whimper or barking, I knew at once what had happened to the thing, there it is again, we had hit. She was too drunk to break it once. By the time she had, we had hurtled another two or three hundred yards and then we came to a complete stop in the middle of the road. She had kept her hands on the wheel. Her mouth was open. A dog, Mr Ashok asked me. Was it a, it was a dog, wasn't it? I nodded. The streetlights were too dim and the object, a large black lump. So again, object, large black lump was too far behind us already to be seen clearly. There was no other car in sight, no other living human being in sight. As if in slow motion, her hands moved back from the wheel and covered her ears. It wasn't a dog. It wasn't a... Without a word between us, Mr. Ashok and I acted as a team. He grabbed her, put a hand on her mouth and pulled her out of the driver's seat. I rushed out of the back. We slammed the doors together. I turned the ignition key and drove the car at full speed all the way back to Gurugayon. Halfway through, she quietened down, but then as we got closer to the apartment block, she started up again. She said, we have to go back. Don't be crazy, Pink Pinky. Bowen will get us back to the apartment block in a few minutes. It's all over. We hit something, Ashaki. She spoke in the softest of voices. We have to take that thing to the hospital. No. Her mouth opened again. She was going to scream again in a second. Before she could do that, Mr. Ashok gagged her with his palm. He reached for the box of facial tissues and stuffed the tissues in her mouth. So this is really extreme, this, this bit here. Um, this, this gagging of her, physically gagging her. He reached for the box of tissues and stuffed them in her mouth while she tried to spit them out. He tore the scarf from around her neck, tied it tightly around her mouth, and shoved her face into his lap and held it there. So he's physically gagged her the way you would, you know, a person who's been kidnapped would be gagged. It's, it's really quite violent and extreme. When we got back to the apartment, he dragged her the, to the lift with the scarf still around her mouth. I got a bucket and washed the car. I wiped it down thoroughly and scrubbed out every bit of blood and flesh. There was a bit of both around the wheel. So when we think about this, this episode... This is Pinky's birthday, and uh, he's he's um, organised a birthday party where they've had pizza um, together, and then he's uh, he's hit her, and then eventually coaxed her out to go drinking with him, and she's had this this 
this accident and killed someone. She's wanted to do something about helping this person and he's he's gagged her and dragged her, physically dragged her out of out of there. Um, it's really quite horrific. And Bowram's the way Bowram's telling it, clearly he doesn't see it that way. And so that's why it's sort of played down Ashok's actions there. I got a bucket, washed the car down, blah, blah, blah. When he came down, I was washing the tyres for the fourth time. Well, I showed him a piece of bloody green fabric that had got stuck to the wheel. It's cheap stuff, sir, this green cloth. I said, rough, rubbing the rough material between my fingers. It's what they put on children. And do you think the child, he couldn't say the word. There was no sound at all, sir, no sound at all. And the body didn't move even a bit. God, Baron. What will we do now? What will we, will we... He slapped his hand to his thigh. What are these children doing? Walking about Delhi at one in the morning with no one to look after them. When he had said this, his eyes lit up. <gasps> she was one of those people. Who live under the flyovers and bridges, sir. That's my guess too. In that case, will anyone miss her? I don't think so, sir. You know how these people in the darkness are. They have eight, nine, ten children. Sometimes they don't even know the names of their own children. Her parents, if they're even here in Delhi, if they even know where she is tonight, won't go to the police. He put his hand on my shoulder the way he had been touching Pinky Madam's shoulder earlier in the night. So this is this homoerotic sort of thing happening again here. And this this, this way that Balram has is uh, soothing uh, Ashok's conscience by saying, you know, Poor people are expendable. She's only a poor child. No one's going to love her. No one's going to care about her. Don't worry about her. He's involving himself in all of this. Then he put a finger on his lips. I nodded. Of course, sir. Now sleep well. It's been a difficult night for you and Pinky, madam. I removed the Maharaja tunic and then I went to sleep. I was tired as hell, but on my lips there was the big contented smile that comes to one who has done his duty by his master, even in the most difficult of moments. So he's proud of the way that he's behaved in this this um, situation. The next morning, I wiped the seats of the car as usual. I wiped the stickers with the faces of the goddess. I wiped the ogre, and then I lit up the incense stick and put it inside so that the seats would smell nice and holy. I washed the wheels one more time to make sure there was not a spot of blood that I had missed, missed in the night. Then I went back to my room and waited. In the evening, one of the other drivers brought a message that I was wanted in the lobby without the car. The mongoose. So what he's doing here is he's emphasising how loyal he's been and how well he's doing what's expected of him. He was wanted in the lobby without the car. The mongoose was waiting up there, waiting for me up there. I don't know how he got to Delhi this fast. He must have rented a car and driven all night. He gave me a big smile and patted me on the shoulder. We went up to the apartment in the lift. He sat down on the table and said, Sit, sit, make yourself comfortable, Bowron. You're part of the family. So I'm highlighting this stuff about the family here. My heart filled up with pride. I crouched on the floor, happy as a dog, and waited for him to say it again. He smoked a cigarette. I had never before seen him do that. He looked at me with narrowed eyes. So I think what's going on here is the way his Bowram's emphasising his dog-like loyalty um, through this whole section to kind of emphasise when he's betrayed, which is coming, how how that betrayal is kind of um, exaggerated by the fact that he has been so incredibly, you know, loyal, and this is fractured by. Um, the the incredible betrayal that, that we're about to read about. He smoked a cigarette. I had never before seen him do do that. He looked at me with narrowed eyes. Now it's important that you stay here in Buckingham Towers B Block and not go anywhere else, not even to A Block for a few days, and not say a word to anyone about what happened. Yes, sir. He looked at me for a while smoking. Then he said again, You're part of the family, Balram? Yes, sir. Now go downstairs to the servants' quarters and wait there. Yes, sir. An hour passed, and then I got called upstairs again. This time there was a man in a black coat sitting at the dinner table next to the mongoose. 
He was looking over a printed piece of paper and reading it silently with his lips, which were stained red with palm. Mr. Ashok was on the phone in this room. I heard his voice through the closed door. The door to Pinky Madam's room was closed too. The whole house had been handed over to the mongoose. So this is really symbolic here. Um, Ashok and Pinky are in separate rooms with the doors shut to Bowram. Mongoose has taken over and is running the show. Sit down, Bowram. Make yourself comfortable. Yes, sir. I squatted and made myself uncomfortable again. Would you like some pan, Balram? The mongoose asked. No, sir. He smiled. Don't be shy, Balram. You chew pan, don't you? He turned to the man in the black coat. Give him something to chew, please. The man in the black coat reached into his pocket and held out a small green palm. I stuck my palm out. He dropped it into my palm without touching me. Put it in your mouth, Balram. It's for you. Yes, sir. It's very good. Chewy, thank you. Let's go over all this slowly and clearly, okay? The man in the black suit said. The red juice almost dripped out of his mouth as he spoke. All right. The judge has been taken care of. This is for your corruption file here. If your man does what he is to do, we'll have nothing to worry about. My man will do what he is to do. No worries about that. He's part of the family. He's a good boy. Again, there's that stuff. He's part of the family. Good, good. The man in the black coat looked at me and held out a piece of paper. Can you read, fellow? Yes, sir. I took the paper from his hand and read. To whomsoever it may concern. I, Balram Howai, son of Vikram Howai of Laxbanga village in the district of Gaia, do make the following statement of my own free will and intention, that I drove the car that hit an unidentified person or persons or person and objects on the night of January 23rd this year, that I then panicked and refused to fulfil my obligations to the injured party or parties by taking them to the nearest emergency um, hospital ward, that there were no other occupants of the car at the time of the accident, that I was alone in the car and alone responsible for all that happened. I swear by Almighty God that I made this statement under no duress and under instruction from no one. Signature of thumbprint, Balram Howai. Statement made in the presence of the following witnesses. Kusum Howai of Laxmanga Village, Gaia District, Chamadas Varma, Advocate Delhi High Court. Smiling affectionately at me, the mongoo said, We've already told your family about it. Your granny, what's her name? I didn't hear that. Mm. Yes, that's it. Kusum. I drove down to Laxmanga. It's a bad road, isn't it? and explained everything to her personally. She's quite a woman. He rubbed his forearms and made a big grin, so I knew he was telling the truth. She says she's so proud of you she's for doing this. She's agreed to be a witness in the confession as well. That's her thumbprint on the page, Balram, just below the spot where you're going to sign. If he's illiterate, he can press his thumb, the man said in the black coat said like this. He pressed his thumb against the air. He's literate. His grandmother told me he was the first in the family to read and write. She said you always were a smart boy, Balram. I looked at the paper, pretending to read it again, and it began to shake in my hands. What I am describing to you here is what happens to drivers in Delhi every day, sir. So this is Balram speaking to Mr. Jabal here. You don't believe me. You think I am making all this up, Mr. Jabal. When you're in Delhi, repeat the story I've told you to some good, solid, middle-class man in the city. Tell him you heard this wild, extravagant, impossible story from some driver about being framed for a murder his master committed on the road. And watch as your good, solid, middle-class friend's face blanches. Watch how he swallows hard, how he turns away to the window. Watch how he changes the topic at once. The jails of Delhi are full of drivers who are there behind bars because they are taking the blame for their good, solid, middle-class masters. We have left the villages, but the masters still own us, body, soul, and ass. So I've highlighted that, obviously. Um, yes, that's right. We all live in the world's greatest democracy here. What a fucking joke. So sarcasm here. Doesn't the driver's family protest it? Far from it. They would actually go about bragging. Their boy Balram had taken the fall, gone to Tihar jail for his employer. He was as loyal as a dog. He was the perfect servant. The judges, wouldn't they see through this obviously forced confession? 
that they are in the racket too. They take their bribe, they ignore the discrepancies in the case, and life goes on for everyone but the driver. That is for, that is all for tonight, Mr. Premier. It's not yet 3 a.m., but I've got to end here, sir. Even to think about this again makes me so angry. I might just go out and cut the throat of some rich man right now. So here, this anger at his betrayal um, by his family, by his employer, by the Indian legal system, um, and the fact that this is not just something that's happened to him, but happened to people like him all over the place, makes him so angry that he wants to 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 attack the rich. Um, and I think we, we get a real feeling for the significance of this incident, this betrayal, particularly because he has been so loyal. Um, this incident has a huge impact on, on him going forward. And that'll be the end of this chapter.